<laughs> right, well, good evening ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest this evening who, as Marilyn's just said, and most of you know, probably because it's up there, yeah. <laughs> he was a member of the club yeah. when I joined in 2008. Yeah. And I have very definite memories of standing out in the car park with a glass of wine on our summer social, which we don't seem to do at the moment, and having David fix some amazing contraption to the top of his car. Probably this. And take a photo of all of us. And I think it's probably going to uh, be shown this evening. Yeah. It, it, was, it was up at the back for years and years. It was. It's only just come down. <laughs> has managed to achieve that rare thing, and that is make a living out of photography. He's specialised in this area of photography, and I think we're going to have a really interesting evening with him telling us exactly how he goes about it in some of ways. So, can I get you to welcome David, please, David. Right. Oh, this is, it's really fantastic to be back here again. Um, I did actually, I'm recording this um, talk tonight as I did six years ago when I gave the same talk. Um, lights on just for the moment. Thank you. Um, yeah, six years ago when I had quite different arrangements of kit. It was still aerial photography based. And in fact, some of, oh dear. Oh dear, it's crashed. <laughs> what, playing? <or>? No, <laughs> not this time. Good old, good old Microsoft PowerPoint. I wasn't even, wasn't even doing anything to it, it was just sitting there. Um, yeah, so some of these images are still very old. Like this one was about 2008, this is around 2009-10. So it was around the sort of time that I was um, still a member here. Um, but since then I've just been um, continually refining, redeveloping, purchasing new equipment, and just you know, experimenting with the equipment that's available. Ultimately, I did wonder whether I'd end up running my own business, but because I've been in the engineering industry for the last five or so years, I did like the regular income, and photography is anything but regular, particularly with the weather you know, at the moment. Um, so it was really last year, 2013, where I realised it was either now or never if I wanted to try and make a, a full-time business of it. Um, you know, I didn't have any ties like you know, children or mortgage, um, and the number of people buying these platforms off the shelf, ready to fly, I'm sure you've heard a lot about them, um, or even have them. <laughs> um, well, it's a bit smaller than that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, either now or never, and given the amount of knowledge and experience that I'd gained since 2006 when I first started experimenting, I figured, you know, give it a go. If it doesn't work, I'll probably go back to the engineering industry. If it does, terrific. Um, so, yeah, this talk really brings that last talk right back up to date. Um, as you can see, I've got new equipment, um, new toys, and yeah, so we'll start off by the same way that I started last time, actually. 2007, um, when I was still at the University of Surrey doing electronic engineering, one of the um, degrees, or one of the modules, was called Engineering Design and Professional Studies. And basically, one of the challenges in there was to come up with a business plan for a typical business uh, doing something novel and unique. And I already had the idea of doing aerial photography. And so I got several other undergraduates to help me put together this, um, this video, um, which gives you a flavor of what things were like seven years ago, because um, this is 2007. And hopefully you'll be able to hear it OK. Hello, and welcome to this promotional video for Horizon Imaging. My name is David Hogg, and I'll be guiding you through the basic steps involved in a typical photo shoot with our company. Can you hear that, okay? Yes. As the saying goes, time is money. And with the aid of this video, I hope to demonstrate the speed of our aerial photography service, from arriving on site to viewing the final photographs. All the equipment used for taking the photographs is stowed neatly in the back of our company vehicle. Unloading takes less than a minute. Once unloaded, the helicopter and backpack are set up and ground checks are performed to ensure full operational functionality of the photography system. Once the client has described the desired composition of the photos to the pilot, a suitable and safe takeoff point for the helicopter is located. After ensuring that the surrounding area is safe from obstacles, people and other hazards, the flight commences. 
To assist in framing the photos, the helicopter is fitted with a wireless video transmission system. This sends a live video signal from the camera to the pilot's video headset and to a screen on the pilot's backpack. Adjustments to the helicopter's position can then be requested by the client. Only once both the pilot and the client are happy with the composition will the pilot remotely trigger the camera to take the photograph. Typical flight times range between 10 and 15 minutes, easily enough to frame and capture numerous aerial photographs. Once the client is happy with the range of photographs that have been taken, the pilot will check the landing area to ensure it is still free of hazards before landing the helicopter. The electronics on board the helicopter and backpack are then switched off before the pilot and client return to the initial setup location. So far, approximately 20 minutes will have elapsed since first arriving on site. The camera is then removed from the helicopter and taken to the car where it is connected to the company's widescreen laptop in order to download and scrutinize the photos that have just been taken. The advantage of being able to immediately view the photographs that have been taken is that if the client is not happy with them, another client can take place immediately. Advanced image editing software is installed on the laptop and allows very quick image adjustments to be made on site, including straightening the horizon and removing unwanted elements from the images such as people or cars. A standard shoot will only take around 30 minutes, and when a client's time is at a premium, speeds such as this will prove invaluable. I hope this video has given you an interesting insight into the operation of the Horizon Imaging Aerial Photography System. Please feel free to take your business card for the stand. That still applies, by the way. Business cards are here. <laughs> <laughs> So that was 2007. Um, if we now fast forward seven years, um, a couple of weeks ago I produced this new promotional video for my website, which has undergone quite a lot of changes in the last year or so, having started doing this work uh, full time. So this is the new version. David Holt, the Managing Director of Horizon Imaging. This brief video will introduce you to the services that we offer, give you a sneak peek behind the scenes of how we operate, and show you how we differ from other photography companies. Horizon Imaging offers three main services, which are covered in the following short sections. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to get an aerial view from anywhere in the sky whilst keeping your feet firmly on the ground? With Horizon Imaging's unmanned helicopter platforms, or drones, this has now become a reality. Flown by an experienced, licensed, and fully insured pilot, the helicopters can fly up to 400 feet above the ground, and up to 500 meters away from the takeoff location. A live video feed to a screen on the ground allows both the client and pilot to see exactly what the camera is seeing, allowing quick composition changes to be made on the fly before the camera's shutter is triggered and the photographs are captured. As our unmanned helicopters fly significantly lower than full-size manned aircraft, our aerial photographs have a greater sense of depth and perspective, and clearly show your subject setting in relation to the surrounding landscape. Unlike some companies which use small GoPro sports cameras for taking aerial photographs, Horizon Imaging uses professional interchangeable lens cameras and our photographs are individually post-processed to ensure they have great definition, clarity, and rich colors. Horizon Imaging's fully portable 50-foot telescopic masts offers a fantastic elevated perspective, and unlike vehicle-mounted masts, it can be erected wherever there is approximately three by three meters of clear ground. This could be in the corner of a building site, on a pavement, indoors, or even on the top of a building. While it's not quite as flexible as a helicopter for taking aerial photographs, the mast is ideal for situations where the helicopter cannot be used, such as in built-up areas, near busy roads, or at events where there are large numbers of people present. A remotely controlled pan, tilt, and zoom gimbal allows the camera to be pointed in any direction, and a live video feed to a laptop on the ground allows the composition to be fine-tuned before the photographs are captured. Often it doesn't take a large increase in altitude to capture a completely new perspective of a building or site, 
sometimes as little as 10 to 15 feet, can make all the difference. Also, as the mast is effectively a giant tripod, and the camera gimbal can pan through 360 degrees, multiple photographs can be captured from the same point in space, and then stitched together to create wide, sweeping panoramas. Aside from taking aerial photographs, Horizon Imaging also offers traditional ground-based architectural photography services, ideal for capturing the interior or exterior of partly built or completed projects or buildings. Whilst this seems to be quite a simple style of photography, a great deal of thought, time and preparation goes into capturing beautiful architectural photographs. The arrangement of furniture, the time of day, the balance of lighting all make a difference. Remove any one of these elements and the resulting images will suffer. Architectural photographs are often the first method of attracting the attention of potential customers. And whilst it is tempting to try and take the photographs yourself, it's a task best left to a professional photographer with many years of experience. I hope this video has given you a taste of Horizon Imaging and what we have to offer. For more information or if you have questions about any of Horizon Imaging services, please visit my website or give me a call. All the details are here. Many thanks for watching this introductory video and I look forward to being of service to you in the future. So hopefully you'll think that's a bit like the original video, but a bit better, <laughs> a bit more polished. Um, so that really sums up what I'm offering now as a business. Um, so as you can see, it's obviously not just the aerial photography, um, because that is so weather-dependent weather uh, and season-dependent. I'm offering other types of ground-based photography, um, particularly the interiors, the architectural photography, and I'm also looking to get into virtual tours as well, which I think I might have even given a talk here about. Um, when I was a member. So, going back to the aerial platforms, let's start by going through the different ones that I brought along here. Um, the first two are actually built from scratch. Um, they took quite a while to put together, but all the inspiration, the ideas, the advice that I needed to build them came from forums on the internet. So, I think, am I right in thinking this club has a, a Yahoo group? Yeah. Um, so it's mu much like that. There's one called RC groups, radio control groups, and they have a whole section dedicated to aerial photography using model aircraft. So this was about uh, 2010, actually, just as I was leaving um, this club. Uh, in fact, I might have even showed... Did I show a picture of this particular one? Um, probably not. But um, so what got me into these platforms as opposed to the more conventional helicopters like you saw in the first video with a big main rotor and a little rear rotor is that these popped on the scene because people started using uh, Nintendo Wii handsets you know where you can play tennis or golf in your uh, living room and break your TV if your remote <laughs> flies out of your hand um, they were taking these things apart, taking the sensors out writing software that took the data coming from the sensors and actually used that to stabilize these vehicles in flight. Um, it's quite amazing. And the, my first iteration of this did actually use a hacked Nintendo Wii handset. Um, I'll, go, I'll show you a picture of some of the sensors I use later. But that got me into it. And this carries a um, Canon PowerShot S95, which is a tiny little compact camera, uh, shoots in RAW, and actually has very good image quality. Um, the shot of St. Martha's on the Hill, you might have seen at the beginning, that was taken with a compact. So it just goes to show you don't need huge cameras to get amazing photographs. And particularly with these aerial platforms, the smaller the camera, the smaller the platform can be. Um, smaller means cheaper, lighter, and um, more easy to transport. So I don't know if you, you probably can't really read the text um, at the back, but just going through it, um, so you've got a battery at the back, which is a little purple thing, um, got three motors, actually I can probably hold this up. So you've got three motors with three propellers on, uh, a very simple mount at the front for the camera which just tilts up and down so I can look straight forward or look straight down. Um, the output of this goes through a video transmitter which then comes down to a screen like this on the ground so I can see exactly what the camera is seeing uh, but wirelessly. So it's just like if you plug a camera into your TV, uh, this just does it with a wireless link. So that allows me to see exactly what the camera is seeing as it's flying around, and then I can 
with the controller, move the helicopter around to get exactly the composition of the photographs that I'm after. So that one is about 1.1 1, 1 kilos, uh, flies for about seven or eight minutes on a battery. Um, the batteries are very small, um, and they're the same sort of technology that you'd use in a mobile phone or a, a laptop or an electric car. Um, lithium polymer, they're rechargeable, and uh, yeah, they give about seven or eight minutes flight time. By the way, do, if you have any questions, don't wait till the end, just um, put your hand up or interrupt, and I'll be more than happy to answer, because chances are by the end, you might have forgotten what the question was. <laughs> How do you get the, you know, because normally with a, with a point and shoot camera, say, like that, you, know, you, you, you look through the viewfinder and you see the picture, mm. and then, is this just totally open the whole time, is it? Um, oh, I see. Yes. Um, so the cameras I use, um, they're not single lens reflex. So basically the sensor is continually giving a feed out to the video link. Just like you, um, if you're using live view on a digital SLR or a compact camera where you've always got the image on the back. Um, so that feed is always coming down to the ground. Uh, the other cameras... So, so camera battery life is an issue as well, is it? It's generally not. No, um... Yes, you're right that having the sensor active the whole time will drain the battery a bit faster, but generally I'm only on site for maybe an hour or so, yeah. and the flight times are my main limiting factor. Um, but that raises another question of um, how I actually control the camera. Basically, I set all the settings, the exposure controls, before I take off. The only thing I have control of in the air of the camera itself is the shutter. So on this particular one, I'm actually triggering it via the USB port. That's quite a long story about how that works. Um, effectively, it's pressing the shutter button, but indirectly. Uh, on this particular one, there's actually a tiny servo that presses the shutter button, which is even more um, simple, but does it, it works. Um, and on the latest platform I'm using, again, that will be triggered via the USB port, where the camera does actually support uh, a remote control trigger. So the exposure settings, I generally use a shutter priority set at around 500th of a second, uh, an ISO generally around 200 to 400 to get a sensible aperture. So not fully open, not extremely small where you, um, you know, get diffraction problems, but generally around f5.6 to f8, something like that. Uh, and it automatically adjusts the aperture to suit, and then I just flick one of the switches on the transmitter, this one here, and that activates the um, camera, the trigger. On all the cameras I use, I use the burst mode. So on the little, on this camera, I think it takes uh, one, one or two pictures a second. It's not very fast. Uh, this one takes 10 pictures a second, which is very useful, uh, because it means if I've got a particularly nice composition, I get 10 virtually identical shots looking at the same subject from the same angle. So I'm guaranteed to get one or two sharp pictures. Um, so that's, that's basically how the camera works. I'll just quickly go through the other platforms. Uh, very, very much the same principle. Uh, the number of rotors makes no difference to how it flies or how it feels to control. Um, so this one's obviously three, this one's six, that one's eight. Um, the good thing about having more propellers is you do have a um, certain level of redundancy. So if one of the motors fails on here, which it has done. Um, it's not going to fly for much longer. Um, <laughs> uh, it does come down quite quickly on whatever is beneath it. Um, but with this, theoretically, if you did lose power to one of the motors, you should just be able to fly uh, on the other five. This bigger platform, which is much bigger, much heavier, much more expensive, um, and carries a much more complex camera gimbal, that actually has eight propellers, but they're arranged in four pairs. I don't know if you can see there, one that sits on top of the other, and that gives excellent redundancy. So if you lose one motor, the other one will just work a bit harder, and you shouldn't actually notice any difference. So this one with six sort of sits somewhere in the middle. Um, this, the, the cameras that I'm mo mostly using these days are Sony uh, Nex. This is a Nex 5T. So it's basically a dig digital SLR type sensor. Uh, but without all the uh, prism and mirror mechanism, which is just unnecessary in flight because you're not looking through a viewfinder. So it's basically a big S SLR size sensor and a lens. 
and the image quality is fantastic. This one is a 16 megapixel uh, sensor. I just recently got the one up from that, which is 24 megapixel, and uh, the quality is just fantastic. It's just as good as an SLR uh, in a very uh, compact package. Um, that's probably all I can say. Um, these two, I've actually, because I built them from scratch, I wanted to make them as collapsible as possible. So this one, believe it or not, actually goes in this case. So it actually goes in that little cavity in there. And so all the propellers come off, the legs detach, the arms fold up, and the camera mount here comes off. And likewise with this one, all the, le the motor arms fold straight. These fold up, uh, and it actually goes in this uh, flight case under here, which I'll, I won't pick up, but um, I had to build that to fit in the back of my smart car, which I still have. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's... Um, it's actually a good thing having a small car. It makes you think differently about how you build things. <laughs> so that's the hexcopter. And then this is the latest one, which hasn't actually been used on any jobs yet because I'm still building it. Um, again, very similar concept. Uh, eight motors instead of six or three. Um, the most interesting thing about... No, I'll rewind a second. This tricopter has a completely manual camera gimbal, so it can just point forwards or point straight down. This one, which I will go into detail more later, uh, as you can see, it actually has a lot of degree of freedom in the tilt and roll axes. Um, and this is actually, when it's on, is fully stabilized, so the camera can move, the helicopter can move around and the camera stays perfectly still. Um, so this is called a two-axis gimbal because it's stabilized in two axes. Uh, this one is a three-axis stabilized gimbal, so... Um, it's a bit ungainly to pick up, but it can move in the pan axis, roll, and tilt. So this isn't actually wired in yet, so it doesn't work. But this, if you've seen any online video from a TV show or film that was taken with one of these, it would have been using one of these three-axis gimbals. If you've seen the quality of footage that you can get, it is just mind-blowing. It's as if you've got a camera that's rock-stable up there on a, on a big tripod. It's, uh, it's the biggest thing that's happened to aerial filming, I think, since they have really stabilised cameras fitted to big, full-size helicopters. Um, is there so, a vibration issues? Um, vibration is, is certainly an issue. Uh, there's a lot you can do to reduce the problems, though. For example, I've meticulously balanced all the propellers which are obviously the main source of vibration. And then there are uh, rubber damping systems between the chassis and the gimbal itself. So it's quite a long, tedious road to go down to get vibration-free footage. Um, Do image stabilizers, in-camera image stabilizers, work to any degree? Before no, unfortunately they don't. Um, the problem with image stabilizing in cameras is that it's designed to counter hand shake mm -hmm. movement, which is a very low frequency. Yeah. But this, you know, if you were to put your hand on part of the frame when it's running, it's like a buzzing, a very, very fast vibration. And actually, unfortunately, um, lenses that have image stabilizing built in perform worse on these sort of platforms than lenses that don't have image stabilizing, mainly because image stabilizing uh, requires a lens element, one of the single lenses inside, to be free to move about, um, and that will start to oscillate <laughs> and vibrate, which is a real pain. So I always leave the uh, stabilizing turned off, and you know, most lenses come with it these days, so you can't really escape it. Um, but for still uh, photography, using a fast shutter speed pretty much clears, all, clears up all the vibration problems. Video is the real challenge and that's what I built this platform for and I'm still in the middle of tuning it so that will be the biggest challenge to get smooth video out of that but hopefully once I manage that it'll be fantastic because that really is where most of the um, market is these days a lot of the companies that set themselves up to offer this sort of service just do aerial video because there's so many more high-paying applications like TV and film work so I've come at it from a different angle because I have a history in aerial photography and I want to then offer aerial video as a service as well because otherwise it's a missed opportunity. Um, so that hopefully beginning of next year I'll start to be offering services with that and uh, fingers crossed 
it all works very nicely. Um, right, what do we have next? Apart from a crashed PowerPoint. <laughs> While you're decrashing, yes, go ahead. <laughs> one of one of the um, uses of of um, helicopters for for video is mm. for fault checking on power lines and network rail using a great deal for looking for problems. Mm. Using infrared, yes, is that the sort of thing you could do with this? Absolutely, with yeah. Camera? Yeah, um, that is a whole different side of the industry. Um, I don't know if everyone heard the idea of using one of these platforms with an infrared sensitive camera or thermal imaging so that you could fly over a building and actually see where the heat is escaping from it. Or as you said, uh, inspecting high tension, uh, high voltage power cables. Um, it's a fantastic idea and it's something I'd love to get into. But at the moment I'm trying to concentrate on areas that I have... Um, experience in and also those cameras are very expensive but particularly with this uh, end platform with the three axis gimbal that actually will have the ability for someone else to control it so I can fly the aircraft and then I give the transmit a second transmitter to someone else they can steer it they can pan it tilt it theoretically zoom in as well and so once that's up and running that is something I'll consider offering because uh, that is a, is a fantastic application. And in fact, there are companies that are just set up to do that kind of inspection work, uh, particularly in the oil and gas industries for inspecting flare stacks on oil rigs. It's a lot easier to use something like this than a real helicopter, uh, a lot safer and a lot quicker as well. So, so do they actually use a drone like that? Uh, a lot of, yeah, they do. Um, they, they all come in different shapes and sizes, but generally that is the, say, the typical layout that you'll see. Um, some of them, yeah, they, they all have, they all come in different shapes and sizes basically, but the principle on which they operate are the same. And that, that the bigger platform, yeah. what's the, because um, obviously a lot of it, the flight time is absolutely on the size of the battery. Yes. So, so how long will you be able to fly the, the bigger platform for? Um, so when I was deciding what uh, batteries to go for on that, uh, it, it's, Ultimately, it's a compromise. If you want very long flight times, you put lots of batteries on it, but, but that makes it... Weight. That's extra weight, exactly. Um, so what I've ended up with should give me about 10 to 15 minutes. That's about 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, which, uh, for lifting that much weight, it'll be about 5.5 kilos all up, uh, which is quite, quite heavy. By no means the heaviest <laughs> platforms that are, that are flown, but uh, I generally don't need very long flight times no. um, because often particularly with uh, stills photography, I know exactly, or roughly, where I need to have the helicopter in the air. I take off generally from directly beneath it, so from taking off to being in position, it's about 10, 20 seconds. Yeah. Um, the biggest uh, drain on time is actually getting the composition right, particularly if I'm working with a client who's also looking at the screen and they just can't quite decide what view they want. <laughs> then, you know, it's, it's sitting up there for five, six minutes, you know, almost, the battery's almost empty and I'm, you know, just chiving him to, to hurry up and make his mind up. Um, How do you keep track of the time? Um, so, in various ways, on the transmitter, uh, it's not very easy to see, but you can set a down counter, which starts counting as soon as you move, which nicely leads me onto this. The left stick, uh, up and down is the throttle, so that makes it go up and down. So as soon as you push the throttle above the bottom, it'll start the counter. Um, and generally, that works very well, because the more flights I do with the platform, the more I know roughly how long I can fly for before the battery uh, is depleted. Um, when I'm testing a new platform, there's something I'll cover later, the, each platform has a data logger on it that keeps... Uh, that logs data about the voltage, current, and uh, the capacity of the battery that's used. And I can look at those graphs afterwards and then work out how long I can safely fly for. So that then all gives me feedback on how long to set the timer for. So um, then does it buzz? Does it what, sorry? Does it buzz? Oh, buzz. Um, it actually beeps and vibrates. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite useful. Um, in the past, um, actually, I'll mention, I'll mention that later. Uh, so, just briefly, how to use this rather complicating-looking handset. 
the items in red are the main flight controls, so they're the two sticks, basically. The left one moving up and down makes the helicopter go up and down. Uh, moving it left and right points the nose left and right, which is called yaw. The right stick pushing forward and backwards is moving forward and backwards, called pitching. And then right and left on the right stick does a roll. Um, and you have to coordinate all of these at the same time, which is what makes flying these things quite difficult. Yeah, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you get older. Video <laughs> it's, uh, ultimately, it, it is hand-eye coordination. Um, and it's something that the more you do it, the easier it becomes, just like you know, driving a car. So I've been flying models of various sorts since about 1998. Uh, the helicopters are the, the most difficult. Because, uh, because they can hover. A plane will always be moving forward, so if you, su if you briefly forget which way it's pointing, you at least know if it's good doing that, that way is forwards. But if something's hovering, particularly these platforms that are symmetrical in so many different ways, if you're at a, lo you know, a long way away uh, and you, you, know, you look down to the video screen and then you look back up, it's very easy to lose orientation. So that's where having a lot of experience in flying them helps. Um, I'll briefly say that the newer platforms do have very fancy features, and in fact, this one does have it called a Return to Home, which I don't know if you've, you've heard of it with your one. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, you're lucky you've got first person view on that, so you can see. Yeah. Whereas on mine, I'm looking up at it and I can't work out which way around it. <laughs> I go forward and it flies backwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the newer platforms, particularly the ones you buy off the shelf, have. GPS assistance, so just like a sat-nav uses GPS to work out where it is, these also have GPS antennas on the top, and there are features that allow you to effectively, when you take off, you flick a switch that tells it this is its home location. If you're in, the, in flight and you lose orientation and you need, to, you need to bring it back quickly, you flick another switch and it flies back by itself, <laughs> which is quite amazing, um, but cheating, really. So. Um, <laughs> um, Actually, on a serious note, that's part of the problem where uh, people that buy these platforms without the experience of flying them without GPS control, you know, these return to home features are very good, but if for some reason they don't work, you know, you can lose satellite reception just like you can do sometimes on a sat nav, then you can be, you know, several hundred meters away, and with, if, you, um, if you don't know how to work out the way, which way it's pointing, then that's how people easily lose the platform. Um, so even though these have GPS assistance, well, the two bigger ones, uh, I don't actually use them when I'm flying, mainly because I'm always f trying to fine-tune the position in flight, um, but also I need to keep my skills in check. Um, and quite a few companies I actually see now on their website, they say, you know, we have the latest technology with GPS position hold, but we don't use it. <laughs> so it's actually like a vote of confidence in the pilots because, as I'm sure people that have tried flying these latest platforms will know, it's very easy to fly them uh, with the GPS assistance. Anyone can pick up a controller and fly it uh, straight away. It's fantastic. Um, but, yeah, for the sort of work I do, particularly the, the expense of the rigs, I don't want to, to run that risk, so I always fly them manually. But I can, you know, use the position hold switch in an emergency if I lose orientation myself, which I have done occasionally. Um, anyway, I'm waffling. <laughs> so, some of the other controls, just briefly. Um, the left slider here will actually control the tilt of the camera, so from straight ahead to straight down. The switch in the corner here is one, the one that triggers the shutter on the camera. And then the platform at the end is the most advanced one, and that has this these return to home functions uh, and position hold. But uh, the other ones are quite a bit simpler. Uh, just briefly, I was talking earlier about the Nintendo Wii handsets. This is effectively what's inside one of those handsets. Bear in mind that is 22 millimeters by 21, so it's a postage stamp size basically. And it is just incredible how small these sensors are. So, like the one at the top, a three-axis digital gyroscope and accelerometer. The one on the left, a magnetometer that detects the Earth's magnetic field in something that small. Um, the barometer as well, they've become incredibly accurate, just so that 
if I lifted a platform from here to here, that very small difference in pressure, you know, because the higher you go, the less pressure there is, that small distance it can actually detect, and then it uses that to help stabilise the platform. It's, uh, it's quite incredible. So that's the, set, the sort of sensors that are used in all these platforms. And in fact, any smartphone will have very similar sensors on them uh, for you know, games where you can tilt the phone to roll a ball around or, or whatever. So, it, yeah, the, the latest technology is quite amazing in what it can do. Uh, mentioned earlier about the self-leveling gimbals. I've um, got a very snazzy diagram here that will basically show you what, how the system it, itself actually works. Uh, very few actual components. So you've got a control board in blue that obviously has power going to it and it has motor control lines that go to each of the three motors in the case of the three axis one. And on the gimbal itself, it's difficult to see, on the bottom here there's a little box and inside that is one of those sensors, the same type that's used to actually stabilise the whole vehicle. And that gives position feedback to the control board uh, as to the angle of the uh, camera tray. So it's mounted to the same thing that the camera is mounted to. So basically when you're setting it up, you tell the sensor or the, the control board, this is what a level camera looks like. And then if it detects any changes in position, it will immediately give feedback to the control board that then sends signals to the motors to move in the opposite direction, if that makes sense. Uh, I think the easiest way to show how this works is to plug it in. Which is why I haven't put propellers on it. <laughs> so you'll see in a second it will self-level, just like that. So then... Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So basically, it will now keep itself completely level, <laughs> um, which blew me away when I first built this. And again, these, uh, the whole system uh, that I'm using here was built by someone for fun on the internet. So it's called an open source project because anyone can contribute towards it. And the, the hardware itself, you obviously pay for to, pay to cover the, their manufacturing costs. But it just, it's amazing what people are willing to do to you know, experiment, to have fun, and then to share their results like this. Um, so, <laughs> um, And so this one will be even more amazing because this being two axis, if I do that, the camera moves with it. And you do notice that in aerial videos. Whereas this one, it will also stay perfectly pointing um, which is, you know, is amazing, I think. <laughs> and it's quite eerie. <laughs> um, so that's how that works. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, but before this sort of technology came along, there were similar systems that were... <laughs> they never worked particularly well. Um, just to take this as an example, this is what goes on top of the telescopic mast. Um, and it uses very big traditional servos and big belt drives. And the systems that were in use before these were just not as good. Um, so these have only been around maybe two or three years. Uh, and at first, this was only available from these people on the forums that were experimenting and you know, starting to build their own boards. But now they're available anywhere in the world. In fact, these the latest off-the-shelf platforms come with one of these gimbals built into it, which is uh, quite incredible. And so anyone can buy one of these off-the-shelf and have a stabilised camera platform, put a GoPro camera on it, and you can, you know, you're away. So, demonstration. I've done that. No, don't crash again, you silly thing. Mm -hmm. I think I should do this with big A3 sheets of paper. It would be a lot more reliable. <laughs> it's because you've got a Mac, but it doesn't like microphones. <laughs> They're fighting each other as we speak. Um, just briefly to cover some of the other technical aspects. 
Um, I mentioned before, and in the video as well, there's a video feed that I can see on one of these screens on the ground. So at the same time as the signals are going from here up to the vehicle for me uh, to control it, at the same time there's a video transmitter on the vehicle that's sending video data back to here. Uh, they have to work on different frequencies, otherwise they would interfere with each other. But basically that's the sort of view I can get. Um, and it's exactly like looking at the back of the camera. So that's how the, the radio links work. Are they just line of sight? So do you get problems with trees? And yes, yes. Um, there are quite strict power limitations on the, the transmitters that you can use. And for that reason, if you do go out of line of sight, like behind trees, then the signal will degrade quite quickly. Um, also, because I'm always manually uh, flying the platform, if I lose sight of it, then that's not a good thing. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And that's actually one of the regulations I have to abide by, is staying within line of sight of the platform. So 400 feet is the, the height ceiling, and 400 meters, I don't know why they mix the units. <laughs> so 500 meters and 120 meters, or 400 feet and 1,500 feet. Furlongs? That way. Furlongs, yes, <laughs> hands. Uh, <laughs> very strange. But at 500 metres away, it would actually be very small. So I tend to keep it within about 100, 200 metres or so. Um, Who set those? Sorry? Who set those um, it's the UK Civil Aviation Authority, so the same body that governs full-size aircraft, airliners. They've put together these list of regulations, which are quite, quite in-depth, uh, that all commercial operators have to abide by. Um, and even if you're not doing it commercially, they still apply to you because um, you know, a lot of them are actually based on common sense. So not flying thousands of feet up where there might be full-size aircraft you know, flying around, just being aware of your surroundings, so not flying over someone else's property that you, that, um, you have no control over. And that's actually the biggest problem these days with the, the platforms you can buy off the shelf. Because people are buying them with no knowledge of these regulations, uh, you don't have to sit an exam or anything to be able to buy one of these. Uh, in fact, I was on holiday in Wales a couple of weeks ago and saw one of these, they're called a DJI Phantom, you might have heard of them. Uh, it's a little quadcopter with a camera on it, and it was just being flown from three, four hundred metres away over um, St David's Cathedral. Um, and there's parkland around it, there were hundreds of people around, and you know, it only takes one propeller to break or a motor to stop running and it could fall straight down on someone. So that's really the, the unfortunate side of this amazing technology that's put these types of platforms in people's hands, um, in the hands of people that have no previous experience. Yes, it's great. They can now fly one of these platforms in their garden, in their park, but yeah, there needs to be some more strict control over I think it's at the point of sale, you know, if you're, going, if you're going to fly one of these things, you must read this first. And then at least if something does happen, you know, they, they can say, you were given these regulations, you didn't abide by them, therefore, you know, we're going to prosecute you or, or whatever. Um, fortunately, in the UK, they've, the CAA have been very, uh, they've thought it through the, with the regulations, because in the US, they very quickly banned any commercial use of these things, which, as you can imagine, that's banning a, an enormous industry from, from growing and developing. So a lot of companies in the US either operate under the radar, so they operate anyway, despite it not being legal, or they've actually gone into a different line of business of building them and then selling them on. But it's, I'm very grateful in the UK that they've been so thorough and... Um, considerate about people like me that are making a living using this, but they haven't just said, you know, we're going to ban this. So it's, 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 it could be worse here, put it that way. <laughs> but uh, I look forward to the day when there are more strict regulations in place about people that buy them off the shelf. Um, I don't know how it will work, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Can you actually change your channels if you, if you recognize there's a problem, like an interference with something else? Um, there are some of these transmitters that do change frequency the whole time, so that if they land on a frequency where there is interference, it's only for a very short space of time. Um, but I think 
the, these things are actually very, very good quality these days, and the, the main problem is people flying them in silly ways, <laughs> put it that way. So um, the technology itself is, is very good. It's just people's behavior that needs to change, really. And I'm just thinking, like, if there's a certain event, and obviously two or three people flying similar things that you uh, have basically been in friends of others, or maybe a photographer who uses remote control to trigger his camera. Yes. I don't know what frequency they're working on. But yeah. Um, well, that's the thing. This works on 2.4 gigahertz, which is the same as um, Bluetooth, I think, the same as Wi-Fi. Um, but they do have very good... Um, it's, it's the way that the data is um, processed before it's sent and after it's received that makes it actually quite bulletproof. Um, these have come a long way, even since I made my last presentation, uh, in being more reliable. So the, the technology is... It, it's very good on that side of things. Is the minimum height you've got to uh, maintain over private property data? Um, I don't... There isn't a minimum height as such. It's as soon as you fly over it, whether you're 10 feet or 400 feet, um, that's really where the, the restrictions kick in. In fact, you have to maintain 50 meters from anything that isn't under your direct control. So some people might be picky and say, oh, well, if I'm 51 meters above their property, then I'm not within 50 meters of it. <laughs> but I consider, you know, you draw a column of space that you can fly in, because if you're over someone's property and something happens, it's going to fall down into their property. So that is one of the regulations I have to abide by. Uh, 50 meters from anything not under my control. So that's basically roads, uh, private housing, uh, a big gathering of people, I'm quite fortunate in that the work I do tends to be in, in the countryside where you know, the, there are very little problems, uh, very few problems with regards to not flying over things. Um, you can operate them in built up areas but you have to have a lot more controlled, uh, the environment has to be a lot more controlled so you have to put cordons out to stop people coming into the area, um, which is it's, it's doable um, and a lot of work has been done in built up areas or in areas where there are full-size aircraft flying around, um, it's quite easy actually to apply to the CAA and ask to operate in a certain area on a certain day at a certain time, and theoretically, um, they will actually direct aircraft around you. They put what's called a, a NOTAM, which I knew what it meant, um, <laughs> around the particular area that you're operating. Sorry. Yes, that's it. <laughs> um, and that, anyone can access them. There's a website where you can look on any day where the restrictions are. And you'll see sometimes it's uh, a new 500-foot crane has been erected here. Uh, there's a red arrows display here. Or there's a drone operating within a 400-meter, you know, 400-foot 400 radius of this area. So stay, stay clear of it. So in that respect, the CAA are very good if you have a need to operate in a built-up area, that there are ways to do it. Is there no fly zone near airports? Yes, yeah, there, so airports are quite tricky things to work around. They have uh, a radius from the center of the runway. It varies depending on the size of the airport. So I think Heathrow has 10 or even 20 miles, where theoretically they are in control of all the airspace right down to ground level, um, just so that, you know, they, they've got a lot of traffic to move around and they don't want to have to avoid you know, uh, lots of different areas. So they just have blanket ownership of the airspace down to ground level. So if I'm operating anywhere near an airport, uh, which has only happened once, I uh, can't remember where it was near now, but I just called the air traffic control centre at the airport and explained what I was going to be doing at what time and they actually said it wouldn't be a problem on that particular day. Uh, at the end of the day, it's just about being courteous to other air users, really. Um, and generally, if you ask, there's not really a problem in, um, in people being flexible. So, um, so, so if someone's hovering one of these over your garden at 25 meters and you mistake it for a pheasant, what's the legal decision? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think like you do that, well, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I w no. <laughs> um, 
then they would be um, breaking the regulations. Um, that's the simple fact of it. But the, the chances of actually being able to find them and give them a ticking off um, it can be quite difficult. In that case I mentioned in Wales, I did actually see the, the people that were flying this thing over St. David's Cathedral, um, and I did give them a, a stern but fair explanation that what they were doing was actually not such a good idea. Um, they, you know, they were having fun, they were getting amazing shots over this amazing place, but you know, they just hadn't put the safety of what they were doing first. Uh, they were putting the amazing uh, imagery first. So uh, I'll just quickly run through this because I appreciate it's about tea time. Um, I mentioned about the data logging on board. So this is what a data logger looks like. It's a little, little electronic module. That's the sort of graph that it creates after each flight. Um, and also this data appears in real time on the top of the screen here. So just see at the top there, I can see what the voltage is, the current, how much capacity has been used, and the altitude. So that's how I know how high I am, so as not to go above 400 feet. Um, and this is very useful, particularly when I'm testing a new platform. I can work out exactly uh, how it's performing and how long I can fly for. Right. Uh, on with the second half. <laughs> Um, does anyone have any questions before I start off my long rant? Uh, uh, yes, please. Yeah. Is there any way we can leave the back lights on just so that you can see me a bit better? Because you can still all see the... If you put the back lights on, can you still see okay? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, that's better. Uh, no, this one is... Um, it's an English firm, actually, that's built this one. Um, yeah, not, not DJI. Did you, actually prepare any of the, did you actually prepare any of the components yourself, or are you buying ready components and just putting them back together? Um, it's mostly the second one. So a lot of the technology on here is available off the shelf in little packages. And so really all I'm doing is connecting the different systems together. Um, thank you very much. Do you do any adjustments to the software yourself, or are you, again, are you buying ready software and just um, implementing that into it? The, the, the only work I do with software is actually the, the flight controllers have an interface on the computer where you can adjust different parameters. So that side of things I have to fiddle with quite a lot when setting them up initially. So I won't go into too much detail, but there, there are different gains uh, in the flight controller as to how much feedback they give to the motors. So if you have too much, then it'll oscillate because it's, there's a feedback going on, um, and if there's too little gain, then it'll, be, it'll feel very soggy to control. So that's all I really tinker with. Um, other people have written the software, fortunately. Um, so, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, um, there's another question. Can you actually fly this in the rain? Uh, not this particular one, but there's no reason why you can't, f uh, if it's fully waterproof, then there's nothing to stop you flying in the rain. How would you no. Um, there are platforms available where all the electronics is contained in a, a sealed waterproof housing. Um, the motors, uh, th these particular ones, I don't believe are designed to be flown uh, in the rain just because they are very open. But I'm sure there are systems out there, particularly uh, the, the technology in these platforms is very similar to what is used in the military. So they must have much tighter controls over uh, things like dust, ingress, sand. So the motors themselves work on the same principle, but they must be a lot um, better sealed. So I'm sure that it's possible to make one that would work in the rain. Why do you ask? I, I, guess, well, <laughs> I guess it will be a bit more expensive. Well, generally, if you shoot in the typical uh, mm. weather conditions, the, the pictures come out. Come yes. Out. Well. <laughs> more appealing because they are, to achieve them, it, it's much more difficult. So same for landscape photography or any type of photography, the mm. difficult conditions, mm. the picture is better. Yeah. Because uh, any can, any, anyone can shoot in the, in the sun. In bright sun, yeah. yes. But surely if, it, if it's raining hard, you don't, you're not wanting to take that photograph anyway because the camera won't take the photo after all. We're not looking for well, arty, arty photos, we're looking for record shots. Sure that there's escaping gases and things like that. Yeah. You, you want to 
wouldn't want to take a photo in the rain over a oh. nice landscape. Building. Yes. When it is bright, nobody wants a rainy photograph. No, yeah, exactly. I would say it's a very good friend of mine. He, he flies some of these like this, and he's seriously good at um, But he actually doesn't do it from a business. He actually does it for art, and he actually it's takes some stunning, stunning, stunning pictures. Mm. But um, I mean, actually, I mean, I don't know. I mean, these are much bigger than in fact than I've got. I've got a little tiny thing. But, mm. but um, the wind that I find is the worst bit. Mm. So if you get a crosswind, it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and that does decrease, or the effect oh, decreases sorry. in size and weight. Yeah. Um, so yes, I mean this tiny platform is very very light. It's 1.1 kilos, whereas this is three and a half. That one's five and a half. And yes, the bigger they are, the less susceptible they are to be pushed around by the wind. Yeah. Um, so, and also this particular arrangement of the rotors, having four pairs of contra-rotating, is also meant to be very good for wind stability. Um, not quite sure why, but um, that's what I've been told. <laughs> okay, um, so I've nearly finished the aerial, uh, the drone section, and then I'll talk a bit, a bit about the mast as well, just to, to round things off. Um, a lot of people in the break were talking about the different applications. Um, th the list is really endless. Um, these are just some examples. Um, these are some quite old photos, but uh, property developers, uh, farmers, if they want to inspect the quality of crops from the air, again, using different types of cameras like infrared will reveal different characteristics of a crop. Um, I think if um, areas that are inf infected or diseased will show up a different temp slightly different temperature, which are things that you can't see with a normal camera. Um, emergency services. These aren't all my photos, by the way. Some of them I have pilfered. Um, but <laughs> emergency services are actually very keen on seeing how these systems can be used. Um, in fact, I'm due to go to a show in London tomorrow called the Commercial UAV Show, uh, which is really all about how this new technology can be used for commercial applications. So that in this case in point, I don't know if this was actually staged or if this was a real incident, but you can arrive on site with all the other vehicles, set this thing up in two minutes, and you're up, and you can take a, an accurate record shot of a, an accident scene. Um, so uh, estate agents, I've done quite a lot of work since I've been full-time for Jackson Stops and Staff uh, down in Midhurst. They have a lot of big multi-million pound houses, and I've done aerial shots as well as the architectural stuff, which you saw in the video at the beginning. Uh, so I offer them the whole package, aerial, external ground shots and internal ground shots, and they really like just being able to send me to a property and I take all the shots that they need. So that isn't in Midhurst, though. That's <laughs> up in the Lake District. Um, schools and universities. This, these two shots here were actually the first shots I took with a model aircraft back in 2006. Um, this is Claremont Fancourt School in Isha in Surrey. Um, um, I think I was about six foot then. No. It's difficult to say, and that, that is a very big building actually, so probably 200 foot. Um, so I was thinking it seems, it seems yeah. so flat. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was actually taken, that was 2006, that was with a, a little 7 megapixel Casio camera. Um, and that was on a, a fixed wing model aircraft. It was one and a half meters wingspan. The camera was fixed, it just looked out of a hole in the side of the fuselage. Um, it's, it's, I did have a video feed though, so at least I could see. You know, I fly past it, there's the building, no, it's gone, I have to go around again. <laughs> um, but um, if it hadn't crashed, I would have sh I'll show you the next picture. <laughs> Silly thing. Crashed yeah. <laughs> uh, there we go. So it's, it's a bit small. You might have seen it at the beginning. That shot of the school has been used really ever since for their marketing purposes. Um, it, it's just such a unique angle of this very old building that no one has seen before because you can't get a helicopter, a real helicopter down that low. You know, that's probably a good two, three hundred foot up. And uh, it's, yeah, just, it shows the building in its natural surroundings, which is why um, 
aerial photos are, are so, you know, so sought after, really. Um, Surrey University, you might recognise that. Um, building sites, I used to do quite a lot of work um, revisiting a building site several times over a period of the, well, the duration of the project. So this one is actually uh, Whisper's Care Home in Hazelmere. And I went there every two months or something for the duration of the project. And so they could show their client a portfolio of aerial shots from different angles uh, to show how the project had developed. This one was actually quite interesting because the, the building at the top there, I don't know if I can move my mouse up there, this building, uh, it was built in the 1900s and it's, it forms part of this new uh, site. But they wanted to make sure that there's no damage to the roof. So on my first visit there, uh, that's actually why they got me there in the first place, I used this helicopter, because that's the only one I had at the time, to fly around the uh, perimeter of the roof, taking shots looking down to just check the quality of the tiles and the, the roofing felt. And it saved them hiring a cherry picker or scaffolding. And that's really something that I'd, I want, I'm keen to get more into because it's, it's a fantastic application of this, um, this technology. There, it's, it's all right because it was in the middle of the countryside. So with the restrictions of where I can fly these, sites like these are, are ideal. But if it's in a very built-up area, then uh, maybe not so much. Um, uh, golf courses, hotels. That was one of my shots. Uh, that's Tilney Hall in, I think it's Hook in Hampshire. Um, that, that's a, a meeting of smart car owners. <laughs> <laughs> Back in uh, 2006 at the Brooklyn's, uh, no, Mercedes-Benz World in Brooklyn's. And I think my car is about here somewhere. <laughs> um, and we all then beetled off down to Brighton and all parked up there. And uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, but again, an aerial perspective. I think that 1,200 cars or something, there's just no other way to show something like that. Uh, no, they're all parked <laughs> two abreast. <laughs> you couldn't get out of those sideways. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's one of my favourite shots, obviously, Guildford Cathedral. Um, if I was taking that now, I probably wouldn't take it now because um, behind where I was flying, there were um, <laughs> private houses. But uh, that was before I was as aware as I am now, shall we say, of the, um, <laughs> the restrictions and, you know, common sense. <coughs> but, um, yeah, that's the uh, Surrey Research Park. Um, and, yeah, lastly, just a shot from this other company's website of inspecting infrastructure, which is something I'm really keen to get into, um, particularly with the bigger platform, as I mentioned before. Just qu quickly to talk about the state of the art. Um, since I gave my last talk here, a lot has changed in terms of the, the latest and greatest platforms that are available. They all now tend to revolve around these multi-rotor helicopters, as they're called, mainly because the, of some of the points I've put there. They're very scalable. If you want to carry a big camera, you build a big one. Uh, you know, put more batteries on, put bigger propellers, and I think the shot up there, it's carrying what's called a red cinema camera, a red epic. Uh, which is, you know, big, several kilos of camera that they use to film feature films, you know, that go into the cinema. And you can get shots with these platforms that you just can't get any other way. Uh, I always use the example of one of the Harry Potter films of the, the car swooping around the viaduct. It was one of the early films that was shot with one of these platforms because, you know, it was so low, it was so near to the aqueduct, I think it even went through some of the archways, and you just couldn't do that with a real helicopter. So this is really where the uh, industry is at the moment. And the most recent improvement has been with these brushless uh, camera gimbals. And you can actually, a uh, slightly different aspect, you can use the same technology to build a handheld rig. So you might be familiar with the term Steadicam, which is uh, a very old mechanically built technology that you effectively wear a huge harness with lots of um, spring damped arms and then you've got a camera here so you can move about and the camera doesn't move.
But now with this technology, you can have a handheld rig that has the same sort of stabilizing that I showed you earlier, but in a handheld rig. So you can do this and you know, run around. You can pass the camera to someone else. And it's really opening up amazing opportunities in the, the film world. Uh, there was one example I saw. Uh, there's a famous filmmaker called uh, Philip Bloom, I think. And he, he put together a sort of demonstration of how amazing this new rig was. And it was just a little film he made. He sort of ran down a corridor following someone. He then seamlessly, you didn't see it, he passed this rig to someone on roller skates, who then followed a taxi down a road. And then he passed it to someone in the car. <laughs> and that was all a single seamless shot that it was, it would be impossible to do any other way. So this technology, whilst it started off in the aerial filming world, it's now uh, sort of creeping into all areas of filmmaking. And um, in fact, that's what I'm hoping to do with this gimbal. Um, just four screws and this whole gimbal will come off. And then I'm planning to build just a simple bar across the top. And so the same camera, I can then do you know, very stable ground video as well, which is something that I'm offering as well now, video production. Um, so yeah, it's, I can't wait to see where we are in another year's time, let alone five years uh, or seven years since I was last here giving my last talk. Uh, a very death by PowerPoint style slide for you here. Um, <laughs> if, anyone, if anyone is interested in using this technology for commercial work in the UK, these are basically the steps that you need to go through. Um, so you need to have the platform, you need to have pilot. You've spotted my amusing bullet point in the middle then. <laughs> um, so pilot training, you can go through organizations that are... <laughs> are um, they're organizations that are set up to basically give you a certificate that say you are a competent pilot, you know how to do your ground routine, you know how to fly things safely. Um, and then once you've got that, you need insurance, then you need to write an operation manual to say how you operate, uh, how you maintain your aircraft. Uh, you need to have a risk assessment, and then you fill in a, a form, give the CAA some money, and then that's it, you're, you're qualified. And that's the sort of process that I've been through. And then each year, you just renew the permission. So and it's... And give them more money. And give them more money, yes. <laughs> it's, it always helps to give them more money. Uh, it's, it's not actually that much. It's, uh, if, if you're starting afresh, it's about £110. And then to renew it, it's about £50. It's just to cover their, their admin costs. But um, this, this really separates proper commercial operations from people that are just trying to do it for fun. Um, and that's one of the things I'm trying to do when I advertise my company is to educate my potential clients that not everyone has done all this because unless... Is it policed? Sorry? Is it policed? Um, I don't... That's the thing. Unless someone has an incident with one of these things, then... No, there's no real way to... You can't look at one of these things flying and tell if the person has a license or not. So that's why I'm trying to tell people whoever I come and, you know, whoever I meet, whoever I'm talking to, um, even if I've spoken to a, a potential client that I'm advertising my services to, if they tell me, oh, we've already got someone that does this, I will try and mention, you know, just make sure that they are insured, make sure they've got the right licenses, because otherwise they could end up not in as much trouble if something goes wrong, but if one of these operators that doesn't know how to operate safely is flying on their site and they hit someone, then it can get very messy very quickly. So customer education, as I've been told it's called, is what I'm really trying to do with this. And actually, if you look at my website, um, at the bottom there's a link to a set of guidelines that I've written for hiring an aerial photographer in the UK. And so that's my sort of suite, if you like, um, because to get that you need to give me your email address. Um, and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it's interesting. I, I've, I've, uh, I'm a member of a, a marketing mentoring scheme, and that's actually a very well-known way of starting to build your relationship with a list of clients. Is to give them something of value, 
uh, not for money, but you know, just to have their email address and their name. Uh, and then each month I send them a newsletter just with links to blog posts on my website, and they can unsubscribe if they want, and, but then they'll already have a copy of these guidelines. So by giving them something for free, it makes them, apparently, feel slightly indebted to you, and so they're happy to give you their email address. Whereas if you just said, give me your email address, then I don't think anyone would. Um, so, yeah, that's really, in a nutshell, what, what it takes to do it commercially. I shall now briefly talk about mast photography. And you might recognize the picture in the middle at the top there. <laughs> Uh, that was <laughs> There's a bigger version of that coming later. Uh, that was taken in 2007, I think, when I was a member here. Uh, so the, the mast, it's interesting, I haven't brought it with me, but it's, you know, it's about, well, you can see a picture of it there, it's about this high, comes in a big four-legged base, it's about 10, 15 kilos, so it's quite a lump to carry around, but it's, it's got applications that none of these things can, can match. Uh, as I'll as I'll show you uh, shortly, it does. Yes, oh. but about that much to spare. <laughs> um, you, you feed it from the boot between the seats into the passenger footwell, <laughs> and uh, it does just fit. I'm I'm pleased to say. Um, it does mean I can't carry a passenger though, because the tripod goes on the passenger seat. <laughs> um, so it sits in a four-legged base. Uh, on the top is this gimbal, which I have brought. Um, it's very simple, it's just pan and tilt, uh, and it's controlled with the same controller that I use for the drones. So it's just got left, right, and pan up and down, and also zoom. Uh, you might have seen it at the video at the beginning. And this is then connected via a USB cable to a laptop, which I'm, I shall now attempt to demonstrate. <laughs> and I think there's a few more. More bullet points. So the mast is, is 50 foot when it's fully extended, uh, and it can still be affected. Oh dear. <laughs> Kabam! <laughs> um, so it's 50 foot. It, I can't use it if the winds are very strong, just because it is a, it's effectively a very long, bendy aluminium tube. But it has some applications that you just can't uh, replicate with the drone, particularly using it in a built-up area. So if I'm, you know, I've done a lot of shots of a school, schools, hotels, which are right on busy roads, where I couldn't use this, but I can just pop the mast up, get 50 foot is actually quite high. Often I don't need to go that high. Uh, and just to see if this, is, this works. You should all be on TV soon. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> In fact, I think I took a picture when I last gave my talk here. <laughs> so I can... Uh, last time I zoomed in on someone just to make sure that it was focused, but I won't do that this time. <laughs> um, but if anyone's used this... Um, it's called tethering to a laptop before. It's, uh, it's very, actually very useful if you're doing studio work or macro work. You can have this set up. Uh, you've got full control of the um, aperture, shutter speed. You can't quite see it on the edge there. You use, uh, the, you use the EOS one, do you? Because yes. I use Tether, but I use Lightroom to do it. Oh, right. I, I wasn't aware you could use that. Yeah, you can. You haven't got as many controls. Okay. I can trigger it from the desktop. Yeah. Um, and I can see what the aperture and everything is. But the good thing is it just then feeds it straight into the catalog. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got full control over here. You can then adjust the focus make sure it's focused, and then when you click download, it downloads the full image straight to your computer, so you can then work on it or you know, make sure that it's focused. Um, I think I've got a few examples. That's still working. Um, I've got a few examples coming shortly. Um, just briefly, I'll cover the different types of masks that are available. Uh, if you don't need to go that high, uh, in fact, this is something a lot of estate agents now do, you can get uh, five, eight, ten meter uh, fiberglass poles that don't need a tripod because they're so light. Um, they tend not to have a gimbal on top, just one of these ball joints, so you set the angle of the camera and then tighten it, pop it up, um, and you just hold it like this, and a lot of cameras these days have Wi-Fi built into them, so you can then stream it to your phone. <laughs> um, if I said that ten years ago, you <laughs> wouldn't have believed me. But, um, so, 
for relatively little money, you know, a couple of hundred pounds, you can get a 10 meter fiberglass mast. Um, that one, there's a chap in the US, that's actually called the Wonder Pole, which is actually meant to be for cleaning windows. <laughs> um, but he's just put his own little camera on top. Um, going slightly bigger, uh, the, the mast I use is manually extended, which is quite laborious and it gets quite tiring after a while. If you have very tall masts, you can actually use an electric winch to get to move them up and down, but that increases the weight further, and so then they're restricted to being on a trailer or a car. But it's obviously a lot easier to put them up and down. Uh, or, and this is how most um, professional mast operators, if that's all they do, they'll have a transit van and a big pneumatic mast permanently fixed to the vehicle on the back, and obviously that's raised and lowered uh, you know, with a pneumatic pump, so there's no effort involved at all. Um, but that does have the disadvantage that a lot of the shots I've taken have been from on a, like a crowded building site. So I can carry this thing with me, as you saw in the video at the beginning, down to the bottom of a garden, to the corner of a building site, whereas you can't get a van like that onto a building site. So they're, they're different tools for different applications. Uh, here are a couple of examples of mass pictures. Or here were a couple of examples of mass pictures. Good old Microsoft. Good old Microsoft. Try again. No, that's not where it's meant to be. <laughs> or that one. OK, let's move on, shall we? Um, so, as I say, different tools for different jobs. Uh, the drone is obviously completely free. It's not attached to anything. You can fly very far away from the subject, very close to the subject. Uh, and obviously you've got a very fine uh, way of adjusting the composition of the picture by panning, tilting, and obviously moving the helicopter around. And in the same flight, you can get lots of different angles of the same uh, subject, which you just can't do with the mast. And as I've mentioned, uh, you can do aerial video as well, which is what I'm <coughs> getting into next with uh, these platforms. But on the other hand, the mast, you can use it in areas where you can't use the helicopter, like this was a, this is a new road bridge, road and railway bridge uh, in Croydon. can't remember how I got the, the job for that, but they wanted an ele elevated shot to show it you know, in use, cars going across it, and that's just somewhere that I wouldn't use the helicopter because it's too dangerous. It uh, can also be used at night or at dusk. That's actually the A3 M25 junction. Um, taken from a, a neighbouring road, just put up 50 foot, I think, and you can use very slow shutter speeds, which you obviously can't do with a helicopter. Um, so that was probably you know, a quarter of a second or something, whereas with a helicopter I tend to use five hundredths or, or faster. Or even indoors. Uh, that was uh, in a church in London, I think, at um, uh, an event they had there, and the camera was right up against the ceiling looking down. So, again, not somewhere you'd want to use a helicopter. Uh, or you can extend it in exactly the same place over a period of time, so to do a time lapse of a, a building site. If you needed to know exactly where you were taking the pictures from, you could mark on the ground where the mast was, whereas with a helicopter it would always be slightly different. Uh, just briefly touching on other methods of aerial photography, um, just to finish things off. A helium balloon, you wouldn't have thought that it would be a viable way of doing it, but if you've got a big enough balloon and a light enough camera, then this has advantages over the mast and the helicopter. There's no flight time limit, uh, because it'll, it'll just sit there until it deflates, I suppose. Um, but helium is not very cheap, particularly for filling something that big for every job. So the people I know that use these keep them stored, uh, filled up, so obviously they're, they're big things and it can be, it's very inconvenient. Um, this one you might not believe. <laughs> um, kites, uh, particularly countries that are, are constantly windy like uh, Hawaii or something that's very, somewhere that's very exposed, you can, they're especially designed kites for carrying, as you can see, very heavy cameras. I think that's a, a full frame Canon 1D by the looks of it. Um, you, Got to be pretty sure it's going to be windy to, to send that up. <laughs> um, but that said, 
it would be too windy for a balloon, it would be too windy for the helicopter. So, again, it's all tools for different uh, applications. Uh, I shall finish my talk um, with a film I produced. Uh, that shot of St. Martha's you saw earlier, uh, I took December 2011. Um, I just went up there for fun one, it was a December morning, very crisp, beautif beautifully, um, beautiful sunlight, uh, first thing in the morning. And for the fun, oh, you can see the picture in the background actually. For the fun of it, I just, I had this helicopter with me with a little camera, and I just tried to document what I was, what I was seeing. So that should still be open, hopefully. Or not. Ah, there we go. So this is how I shall end my talk this evening. Um, as I say, it's, it's three years old, but I haven't made anything quite like it since. And it was taken with, as I say, the tricopter. I took some ground shots with my 40D, I think I had at the time, and I did some time-lapse, uh, I assembled time-lapse videos using still images taken with an intervalometer, so taking pictures every few seconds and then making a video out of it. And, uh, yeah, I still haven't made anything better than this, so I think I'd like to finish tonight with this. Can we have the... Yes, thank you.
the end of my talk. <laughs> Yes. David, thank you so much. There's been so much interest in this technology. I think I came not quite knowing what to expect, but I thought it was wonderful. And that film, that last film, I thought blew me away. So thank you. It really was lovely. Thank you very much. So thank you again. Thanks for giving up your time again. And come back again in another eight years. Yes. <laughs> Oh, maybe, you know, two years down the line. It's yeah. really hard to tell where I'll be. Yeah, yeah. yes, the aerial video, definitely. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, thanks again. Thanks Pleasure.